Lecture 5, The Prophetic Vision of Zion, Part 1. The Book of Mormon is the keystone of a religion and the idea of Zion. We want to come to the subject of the prophetic vision. I'd like to begin by calling your attention again to some of the statements that President Benson has made. He has given some very positive and pointed statements in relation to the last days and our responsibility in connection with the last days. In one of them, he says, repentance was the cry of our late and great prophet Spencer W. Kimball. This theme permeated his talks in the pages of his writings, such as the marvelous book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. And it must be our cry today, both to member and non-member alike. Repent. Watchmen, what of the night? We must respond by saying that all is not well in Zion, as Moroni counseled, we must cleanse the inner vessel, beginning first with ourselves, then with our families, and finally with the church. A prophet of God stated, Ye shall clean away the bad according as the good shall grow, until the good shall overcome the bad. There is one bit of counsel by President Benson. Here's another one, and here he cites several other earlier brethren. He says, Considering some of the challenges which the church faces currently, and which it will continue to face in the future, three statements of former church leaders come to mind. There are at least three dangers which threaten the church within, and he is quoting here President Joseph F. Smith. They are flattery of prominent men in the world, false educational ideas, and sexual impurity. These three dangers are of greater concern today than they were when identified by President Smith. A second statement was a prophecy of Heber C. Kimball, counselor to President Brigham Young, speaking to members of the church who had come to the Salt Lake Valley. He said, To meet the difficulties that are coming, it will be necessary for you to have a knowledge of the truth of his, this work and this for yourselves. The difficulties will be of such a character that the man or woman who does not possess the personal knowledge of witness will fall. If you have not got the testimony and light of the Lord in your life, then you will fall. If you do not, you cannot stand. The time will come when no man or woman will be able to endure on borrowed light. Each will have to be guided by the light within himself. If you don't have it, you will not stand. Therefore, seek for the testimony of Jesus and cleave to it. And when the trying times come, you may not stumble and fall. The third statement, he says, is from President Harold B. Lee, my boyhood companion and friend and 11th president of the church. We have some tight places to go before the Lord is through with the church and the world in this dispensation, which is the last dispensation which will usher in the coming of the Lord. The gospel was restored to prepare a people ready to receive him. The power of Satan will increase. We see it in evidence on every hand. There will be inroads within the church. We will see those who profess membership, but secretly are plotting and trying to lead the people not to follow the leadership that the Lord has set up to preside in his church. The only safety we have as members of this church is to do exactly what the Lord said to the church in that day when the church was organized. We must learn to give heed to the words and commandments that the Lord shall give through his prophet as he receiveth them. Walking in all holiness before me, saith the Lord. There will be some things that will take patience and faith. You may not like what comes from the authorities of the church, but if you listen to these things as if from the mouth of the Lord himself, with patience and faith, <clears throat> the promise is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord shall disperse the power of darkness before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and for his name's glory. It seems to me that we have within these three prophetic statements the counsel that we need to the counsel that is necessary to stay valiant in our testimony of Jesus or of the work of his church in these troubled times. One who rationalizes that he or she has a testimony of Jesus Christ but cannot accept direction and counsel from the leadership of his church is in a fundamentally unsound position and is in jeopardy of losing exaltation. These are statements by the President of the Church, President Ezra Taft Benson. Let me just give you one more. He says, We may expect to see the righteousness of the saints and the progress 
of the kingdom of God continue unabated, but it will not be without opposition. The Council of the Twelve proclaimed in 1845, and this is that famous declaration of the Twelve written by the commandment of the Lord, and I am quoting, or he is, from this proclamation. As the work progresses in its onward course and becomes more and more an object of political and religious interest, no king, ruler, or subject, no community, or individual will stand neutral. All will be influenced by one spirit or the other, and will take sides either for or against the kingdom of God. Yes, as the Lord declared, Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. Her borders must be enlarged. Her stakes must be strengthened. As righteousness will increase, so will evil. We see evidence of this all about us. It sometimes causes members of the church to despair. We may be assured, however, that the Lord will take care of this in his own time and in his own way. Hear his decree. He is quoting now from section 6333. I have sworn in my wrath and decreed wars upon the face of the earth, and the wicked shall slay the wicked, and fear shall come upon every man, and the saints also shall hard hardly escape. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, am with them, and will come down from heaven from the presence of my Father, and will consume the wicked with unquenchable fire. President Benson then says, We may not be too far from the day pro prophesied by Heb Heber C. Kimball, grandfather of President Spencer W. Kimball, a member of the First Presidency. The saints will be put to the test that will try the integrity of the best of them. The pressure will become so great that the more righteous among them will cry unto the Lord day and night until deliverance comes. But remember the Lord has said in modern revelation, If ye are prepared, ye need not fear. Now with this in mind, my brothers and sisters, the living prophet today has given us special warnings of judgments and special counsel. This is part of the global program. We have never had a dispensation of the gospel on earth that didn't carry with it also the proclamation of judgments. You go back and read the history, for example, of the Lord's people in the days of Enoch, of the Lord's people in the days of Noah, of the Lord's people with Abraham, of the Lord's people with Israel, and it just comes right on down that apparently inseparably associated with the restoration of a new dispensation or the institution of a new dispensation is also the voice of warning. Among other things, the Doctrine and Covenants is also a voice. It is not only the capstone of a religion, but it is certainly a voice of warning to a modern world. President Benson, dealing with this, says, Too often we bask in our comfortable complacency and rationalize that the ravages of war, economic disaster, famine, and earthquake cannot happen here. Those who believe this are either not acquainted with the revelations of the Lord, or they do not believe them those who smugly think that these calamities will not happen, that they somehow will be set aside because of the righteousness of the saints, are de deceived and will rue the day they harbor such delusion. The Lord has warned and forewarned us against a day of great tribulation and has given us counsel through his servants on how we can be prepared for these difficult times. Have we heeded these counsels? And then this statement from President Benson. The world will present a scene of conflict such as has never been experienced before. Still, men's hearts will be hardened to the revelations from heaven. Even greater signs shall be given to manifest the approaching great day of the Lord, and they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, and they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke, and before the day of the Lord shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon turned to blood, and the stars fall from heaven. I realize that this is an unpleasant topic on which to dwell. I take no delight in its portrayal, nor do I look forward to the day when calamity shall come upon mankind. But these words are not my own. The Lord has spoken them. Knowing what we know as his servants, can we hesitate to raise a warning voice to all who will listen, that they may be prepared for the days ahead? Silence in the face of such calamity is sin. Now, let's talk about Zion. Because Zion is to be a place of refuge, 
As the Lord says in section 45, as he speaks of that future day when the new Jerusalem is built, he says it will be called, verse 66, and it shall be called the new Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints, for the most high God. Those terms are meaningful as he expresses them. We need to give them heed. A land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety. Let's just spend a little time here on the idea of Zion. Let me go back to some of the things that were discussed this afternoon and make clear that we're not merely talking about some theory and some idea, but that we're talking about a body of people who are alive in Christ, where the powers of the Holy Spirit permeate their mist. And when they are quickened and enlightened by the gifts and the blessings of the gospel, and where they see things in the light of the Lord's Spirit and feel things in the light of his love. First of all, Zion is built on a spiritual principle. You say, how can we prepare? And yes, we are counseled to have a year's supply, but the most important preparation is spiritual. Those people who merely prepare in the sense of temporal things will find that the very things that they hoard will be the things that invite and incite opposition against them. The primary thing, the primary thing is spiritual preparation. This means then coming to the Lord with that kind of faith where we begin to walk in the light of his spirit and where we begin to love the brethren and we begin to truly sustain the prophet with our whole hearts and souls. In section 29, the Lord here talks about the commandments he has given unto the people and he says in verse 34, Wherefore, verily I say unto you, that all things unto me are spiritual and not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal neither any man nor the children of men, neither Adam your father whom I created. You say, well, is tithing a spiritual principle? And the answer is yes. Is the welfare program a spiritual principle? And the answer is yes. The requirement to prepare and have a year's supply a spiritual principle? The answer is yes. The Lord has never, nor will he ever give a temporal commandment. All of these are spiritual and they need to be seen in that light. There needs to be a context established. It isn't just that we belong to the Kiwanis Club and we've de decided to prepare for adversities that are coming. We are those people whom the Lord has chosen to build Zion. And Zion primarily is a spiritual program and everything that we do has that basis and that orientation. Another requirement as we see Zion First of all, it is a spiritual program. Secondly, it requires a willing mind and a willing heart. This attitude and this disposition are very vital. Here in section 64, the Lord makes this statement. Verses 33 and 34. Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying up the foundation for a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. Along with a willing heart and a willing mind is the attitude of esteeming each other as their own selves. The Christian law is not that we become walking mats, and that we just allow people to walk over us unrestricted. Read section 98 on that. It tells you the limitations of that kind of approach. That doesn't go on and on, but the Christian law is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. As is not better, and it is not less. The Christian law is that you put yourself in the other person's position when you are con contracting a deal, and that you transact that deal with as much interest in him or her as you have with yourself. I remember when I was a young man and was out trying to raise money to get on back to Santa Cruz University to get an education, and the Lord blessed me in that. I had $300 at the beginning of the spring and everything I touched turned to gold. It literally did. But in the course of that experience, the Lord gave me one experience that I have continued to think about over the years. I went to a neighbor who had some cattle for the purpose of buying a particular animal. This was a Holstein heifer and I was just buying and selling. As I said, when I got that call, I had more money than I thought I could get. But I talked to the brother in the family and had contracted a deal with him. As I was walking out of the backyard through the lot where the house was standing, the good sister came out of the home and said, I would like to talk to you. 
She said, do you know this and this and this about that animal? And they were negative things. Fortunately for her and for the whole thing, her husband had well informed me about that. He didn't let that go, so that in that transaction, they considered my interests as though they were the buyer. I've always thought of that as one of the examples of a good neighbor and of living the Christian law. The Christian law requires that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And in the great revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord sought to prepare the saints for the law of consecration, and I have reference to section 38. This is the first revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants preparing the saints specifically for the law of Zion. He says this in verse 24, And let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And again, a note that he rep repeats it, And again, I say unto you, Let every man esteem his brother as himself. Then he bolsters and fortifies that statement repeated twice with this parable. For what man among you, having twelve sons, and is no respecter of them, and they serve him obediently, and he saith unto the one, Be thou clothed in robes, and sit thou here, and to the other, Be thou clothed in rags, and sit thou there, and looking upon his sons, and saith, I am just. Behold, this I have given unto you as a parable, and it is even as I am. I say unto you, Be one, and if ye are not one, ye are not mine. The oneness that he is talking about here is the oneness based on the Christian law of loving our neighbors as ourselves, and it is the basic foundation of the law of Zion, to be that honest and considerate of other people. This, then, is another requirement. Keep in mind also that Zion is founded on her mount, as we talked about this afternoon. Her mount is the temple. That means that Zion is founded upon the sacred covenants of the house of the Lord, of obedience, and of sacrifice, and of the law of the gospel. Some people ask, what is the law of the gospel? The answer to that is the Sermon on the Mount, that law that requires us to forgive our enemies and to love them, that law that requires us to be so pure that we do not look with lust on someone else, that law that requires us not even to be angry, let alone to commit some overt act, not even to be angry against our neighbor. You, you can't come to that law without spiritual renewal. It just can't be done. You may will to do so in your mind, but the Sermon on the Mount is not a practical law for the world. It's only practical for those people who have been renewed in Christ and who are fulfilled with his love and who have his law engraved upon their hearts and who have that so firmly grounded in their lives that they act on that principle. It then becomes a very meaningful thing in that way. It also requires us to obey the law of virtue and the law of consecration, etc. In this sense, then, Zion is to be founded. Let me put it this way. Zion is the unfolding of gospel covenants. Zion is not something different from the gospel. Zion is an extension of the gospel. It's the blossoming of the gospel. It's the unfolding the development of gospel life and the extension of those basic principles of the gospel into the practical world, to not only sanctify ourselves, but to sanctify the world and our whole community, so that in the end, not only can we be endowed with the powers of the Spirit, but as section 124 says, you can endow Zion and all her municipals with the Spirit. For example, the covenant of consecration is merely an extension of the covenant of baptism. In the covenant of baptism, you give yourself to Christ. In the covenant of consecration, you take this thing out of your back pocket and you put it right there and say, Lord, there it is. One is merely the extension of the other. In baptism, we commit to take upon ourselves the name of Christ and to act as he would act and to seek his spirit. In consecration, we consecrate our time, our talents, and all that we possess to Christ, and this to the proposition that his divine and holy order will economically institute an order of things where we love our neighbor as ourselves, and where each person in the program of consecration and stewardship will have an equal right and an equal opportunity to acquire and to enjoy the good things of this life. So you consecrate to the proposition of social equality and economic equality, and it's that kind of thing. 
For example, in baptism, we obtain a remission of sins. There is such a thing as retaining a remission of sins from day to day. When our favorite number two son was eight years of age that summer, we had contracted to go to Hawaii and teach at the church college. Knowing that he was going to turn eight years of age while we were there, we got the permission from our bishop to perform the ordinance of baptism there in the ocean in Hawaii. So as that day arrived, we and a few friends donned our white pants and white shirt and headed down to the beach bright and early in the morning when no one else was around. There on the beach of La Ye, we had a nice, beautiful baptismal service. Then he and I walked out into the water waist deep, and it was there that we baptized him. On the way back to where we were living, as we walked hand in hand, he looked up at me and said, Daddy, you know I need to be baptized twice. It didn't dawn on me at first what he was really driving at, so I asked him, How so? Don't you think this one is any good? He said, No, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, what do you mean by I ought to be baptized twice? He said, Well, I need to be baptized now, and then I need to be baptized just before I die. You knew what he had on his mind in a particular way. I said, Well, why so? He said, So I can get a remission of sins now, and so I can be sure to have a remission of sins when I go back to Heavenly Father. That is planning ahead for you. So it required me to go into another dimension of the gospel. That is simply this, that there is a divine program designed to give us the remission of sins, a program by which we can obtain a remission of sins. That program is to have faith in Christ, to repent and be baptized by one having proper authority and in the proper way. There is a scriptural program designed to carry that action and that benefit with us every day so that every evening as we go to bed or retire to our beds at night, you can be just as though you had been baptized prior to retiring. There is a program of that nature, and it's called that divine program by which we can retain a remission of sins from day to day. Let me recommend to you Mosiah 4, where the great King Benjamin in his discourse to the saints in his day not only gave them the law required to be renewed and regenerated, from the natural man state, where we are enemies to God, but to put off the natural man and become saints. But he then went further and talked to them about how they can, he says, quoting from verse 12, always retain the remission of your sins, and ye shall grow in the knowledge of the glory of him that created you, or in the knowledge of that which is just and true. And then he deals with some of the specific points, and the basic idea is that we take upon ourselves the name of Christ, and we actually follow through and emulate him, and do as he would do, and conduct our lives on that plane. So he says, verse 13, And ye will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably, and to render to every man according to that which is his due. Here again is the Christian law to love your neighbor as yourself, not better and certainly not less. He says, And ye will not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked, neither will ye suffer that they transgress the laws of God and fight and quarrel one with another. When ye are really cutting it up and it's a real cut up, your remission of sins is going down the tube if you haven't fulfilled your responsibilities. That's what he is saying. He says, But ye will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. Ye will teach them to love one another and to serve one another. And also ye yourselves will succor those that stand in need of your succor. He will administer of your substance unto him that standeth in need. And ye will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain and turn him out to perish. Then he continues on that theme in his explanation. The great summary statement is in verse 26, as he summarizes and ties things together in a clear and concise statement. And now, for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is, for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that ye may walk guiltless before God. Now what has he said there? He said that you can retain a remission of your sins from day to day, so that you walk guiltless, so that as you retire at night, we are as though we had been baptized immediately before getting under the covers. That's what he's saying, and you can do that. In order to do that, then, he says, I would that ye should impart 
of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and ministering to their relief, both spiritually, and that's home teaching, brethren, and temporally according to their wants. When I see a person who wantonly and in a flagrant way sets aside his responsibility as a home teacher, I just chalk it down that the remission of sins for that person is wavering in the balance. When I see a person who fails to pay his fast offering and to contribute to the welfare program, I simply chalk it up to the fact that that person is not fully covered by the benefits of Christ's atonement. That's the kind of thing that we see as we see the correlation between the gospel program and the economic program of Zion. For example, in section 104, the Lord is talking about his preparations on this earth to sustain the human family and how well he has done it and how if we were to act on proper principles, there would be no poverty on earth. He says, verse 14, I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine, and it is my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine, but it must needs be done in mine own way, and behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for, all, for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted, and that the rich are made low through their consecrations. He says, For the earth is full, and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, and the, here's the punchline, If any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion, according to the law of my gospel, now there is a gospel law that requires imparting substance to those who are in need, and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes to hell, being in torment. Now why? Because he has no access to the atonement of Christ. Retaining a remission of sins is a thing of the past for him. He is on his own, and under those circumstances, the person who does not live the law that requires sensitivity to the needs of the poor and the ministry that is required spiritually as well as temporally, that person who neglects that cuts himself off from the atonement. It's on that basis, my brothers and sisters, that the gospel program unfolds to the Zion program. The economic program is not different from the spiritual program. All things are spiritual. And then the end result tie in with the gospel. When a person complies with the sacred ordinance of baptism, they obtain a remission of sins. When they comply with the law to retain a remission of sins, then they are clean and free, not because they've walked righteously all day long, they may have made some mistakes in that kind of thing, if they are made wherein they do not sin willfully, but it's a matter of the weaknesses of the flesh and the disposition, etc., then the mercy of Christ still has effect upon them. But in addition to that, they have the gifts and the blessings and the powers of the Spirit. I remember once reading section 46, which is one of the three statements in Scripture on the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And as I read this and read the first part of it, my heart dropped out, and I despaired and said, Hey, I haven't a prayer for a chance. I don't have a prayer of a chance for these gifts. Then I read a little further on. Note what he says here, beginning with verse 8. Wherefore, beware lest ye are deceived, and that ye may not be deceived. Seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. For verily I say unto you, they are given for the benefit of those who love me and keep my, all my commandments. And there's where my heart dropped out from under me. Then I read on, And him that seeketh so to do. That is a tremendous little statement. And him that seeketh so to do. If a person's heart is right before the Lord, if a person's intent is right and they are struggling honestly and ma manfully against weaknesses and they don't quite measure up, are they denied the Lord's mercy? The answer is no. Are they denied his gifts? The answer is no. The point out of this that I would like to make, the whole thing, is that the gospel is here not just to be a Sunday religion. It is here to transform our lives. It's here to be extended into our social relationships. It is here to be extended into our economic affairs. And it's here to extend into the political life 
to sanctify society and to give us that foundation spiritually that is necessary for Zion to become an ensign and a standard to the world. So it is not proper, as so many people do, to put their religion into one pocket and their daily activities into another pocket. That kind of philosophy and attitude leads to damnation and hell. Instead, meet the challenge of integrating the gospel into your life. When I was back at Syracuse, I served there as a member of the district presidency to a man that I grew to love dearly. He had a sixth grade education and just massacred the king's English. Yet when that man spoke, the power of the spirit literally radiated. He just bristled with the spirit. And there was a strength and a power in that man that I envied. He was in tune enough with the Lord that the spirit of revelation was with him and he walked and acted and talked in that. He was raised as an orphan boy with another family and he got a call from the people concerned that his foster mother was in the hospital and not expecting to live until morning. He hopped on the plane, headed to Florida, went to see her in the hospital, laid his hands on her, gave her a blessing and turned around and hopped on the plane and came back. In the process, people followed him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going back to Syracuse. They derided him. She's going to die. He said, no, she won't die. In fact, she's going to leave the hospital very soon and be up and around. He headed on back and the next word he got the next day, she was out of the hospital and home. He was a man of power, spiritual power, but he also integrated the gospel into his business. He was head of the truck division of Brazi Chevrolet, which was the largest Chevrolet truck distribution center of central western New York, and people would come for miles to deal with that man. When they came in, they would say, we will not deal with anyone but Jimmy Jameson. Why? We know he is honest. We know he will treat us as though he were treating himself. I've seen people come from miles to deal with him, to transact business with him. When he finally passed away, died of a heart attack, the whole city of Syracuse closed down for one day in honor of Jimmy Jameson. Businesses closed up and the city closed down. There was a man who brought the gospel into his life and who, with a sixth grade education, who massacred the king's English, but who had a character and a spiritual power that I envied, and who had a love for people and a respect for them and they for him, so that on their own, in memory of him, they closed down the city because he, a Mormon, had passed away. The gospel is that kind of thing, but it needs a spiritual underpinning, and this is very well exemplified in the efforts the saints made in the early days of the church to establish Zion. They went down to Jackson County beginning in the summer of 1831. People began to pour into the county. They began to build homes, lay out farms, establish themselves. Before July of 1834 transpired, they were out of the county as strangers and wanderers in the world without a place to live. And under those circumstances, the Lord instructed the prophet Joseph Smith to gather up the strength of Zion and to go on that famous march that we call the Zion's Camp March. That group of men left the Kirkland area and went on down to Jackson County, Missouri. When they got there, they had to pledge to the governor that if they could muster enough force and supporting power to retain themselves on their lands, that he would reinstate the saints and bring them back to their lands. But when they got there, then the governor had a change of mind. Politically, someone got to him. He reneged on his commitment, and since he wouldn't do anything, Zion's camp had to be disbanded. But in the midst of that, the Lord gave the saints a revelation there at Fishing River. In that revelation, he makes some very significant statements. I'd like you to read this with me in light of this idea, that while they are dealing with temporal things and practical things, and they are dealing with trying to institute the law of consecration and stewardship, there is a spiritual element foundation and power associated with that, without which they could not do what the Lord wanted them to do. Note what he says in section 105, verse 9. Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. This is where he canceled out the program, that they themselves may be prepared and that my people may be taught more perfectly and have experience 
and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. Now note this, and this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. What cannot be brought to pass? The things he talks about in the previous verse, that they might have experience and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. The things he was requiring was that they live the law of consecration and establish that program in a practical temporal program. But then he says, This cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I have prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them, inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Therefore, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. So having canceled out in that sense, but still continuing to build, but now this time with the emphasis on the spiritual program. Then the Lord turned the attention of the brethren to the Kirtland Temple, its completion and the great endowment that would be poured out at that time. In order to see that, let me go back to section 38, and let's follow through with what the Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants concerning this anticipated endowment, which is the foundation of Zion, because Zion is not merely a temporal thing. It's the extension of the spiritual into the temporal. And you have to have the spiritual in marked degree in order to really carry off the program. In section 38, the Lord gave the first revelation, opening the door for the knowledge of the law of consecration in our time. In that revelation, having told the brethren that they should esteem their brother as themselves, then he continues here in verse 31. He says, And that ye might escape the power of the enemy, and be gathered unto me a righteous people, without spot and blameless. Wherefore, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment that ye should go to the Ohio, that is, move from New York to Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law, and that law is the law of consecration and the law of Zion, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. Now the law and the endowment go together. Then he adds this further comment, And from thence, whosoever I will shall go forth among all nations, and it shall be told them what they should, shall do. For I have a great work laid up in store, for Israel shall be saved. And I will lead them whithersoever I will, and no power shall stay my hand. So from this revelation they were brought to Ohio. He was going to give them the law. He was going to endow them with glory. This endowment of glory was to be the beginning of the foreign missions of the church. That's what he is saying. In section 39, he comes back to that same theme. In verse 15, And inasmuch as my people shall assemble themselves in the Ohio, I have kept in store a blessing such as is not known among the children of men, and it shall be poured forth upon their heads. And from thence men shall go forth into all nations. Here again are the same three basic points, the endowment and the beginning of the foreign missions of the church. Turn with me to section 43, where the Lord comes back to this over and over again. Verse 16, And ye are to be taught from on high, sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be endowed with power, that ye may give even as I have spoken. Turn to section 95, where the Lord again comes back to that. In the meantime, as you go through... The documents of the church, and I'm not talking about written documents in the sense of treatises of church history. I'm talking about the letters, the manuscripts, the communications that were back then. This idea of receiving the endowment was spoken of over and over and over again, with the intent that they knew and they understood that they were going to have a modern Pentecost, and that this was the intent of the purpose of what the Lord was saying, beginning with verse 4. For the preparation wherewith I design to prepare mine apostles, and this is a preparation to teach the gospel. This is a preparation, the spiritual endowment necessary as an endowment to spread forth the gospel message. For example, if I can just interpolate when the Kirkland Temple was dedicated, William W. Phelps wrote a hymn especially for that occasion. It is called, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning. That's a popular one among Latter-day Saints. One verse of it says this, We will call in our solemn assemblies in spirit to spread forth the kingdom of heaven abroad, that we, through our faith, may begin to inherit the visions and glories and blessings of God. That's the purpose of the solemn assemblies, 
That's the purpose of the endowments of the Spirit. When I was in the mission field, we had a 10-hour missionary conference. It lasted 10 hours without a break. The Spirit was so concentrated in that meeting that you could almost cut it with a knife. When we sang the closing song, God Be With You Till We Meet Again, I and several others stood there and listened. And a heavenly choir opened up and they sang with us. It made the tabernacle choir sound like a group of yokels. We went forth out of that conference filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Within the next two months, my companion and I had baptized 32 people and organized a branch and started building a chapel. That kind of endowment with the powers of the Spirit that were there, that kind of thing is the thing that we're talking about. This is the thing that Joseph Smith was trying to establish as a basis for building Zion. And this is why it is so important that we cleanse the inner vessel and why it is so important to wake up spiritually, and that we be born of God and experience the mighty change that President Benson has been talking about. That's why we do it, because this is the basis of all else. The Lord says, For the preparation wherewith I design to prepare mine apostles to prune my vineyard for the last time, that I may bring to pass my strange act, that I may pour out my spirit upon all flesh. See, the great object is expressed there in Article 10 of the Articles of Faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion will be built upon this, the American continent, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. That's the great objective, and this is what the Lord calls his strange act. It is accomplished through gospel principles and teachings and through implementing the Zion program, not something aside from the gospel, but the blossoming of the gospel out into our daily lives and our daily activities. He goes on and says, But behold, verily I say unto you, that there are many who have been ordained among you, whom I have called, but few of them are chosen. They who are not chosen have sinned a very grievous sin, in that they are walking in darkness at noonday. And for this cause I gave unto you a commandment, that you should call your solemn assembly, that your fastings and your mourning might come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, that is, the Lord of the first day which is, by interpretation, the creator of the first day, the beginning and the end. Yea, verily I say unto you, I give unto you a commandment, that you should build a house, in the which house I design to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. For this is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore I command you to tarry, even as mine apostles at Jerusalem. Some people think that the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem just happened. They just happen to be gathered together in celebration or commemoration of what is called Pentecost, a Jewish holiday. They just happen to be there, and all of a sudden something happened from heaven, and they were endowed with cloven tongues of fire, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. The prophet Joseph Smith teaches us that the apostles prepared for Pentecost, and he himself prepared for Pentecost. He made a calculated intent to do all those things that were necessary with the saints, And this centered in the Kirtland Temple, to complete the temple, get it dedicated, hold a solemn assembly, perform the sacred rites of the priesthood associated with that, and there were those, and then bring the brethren to the point where they could receive a modern Pentecost. This kind of thing just doesn't happen. It is a calculated thing. And when saints apply themselves as they should and live as they ought, and the gospel program is open to them in its powers, then the end result is a cloud and smoke by day and a flaming fire by night. Here in the teachings, page 168, the prophet talks about the gospel and what it means. It's not just a system of theology. It's not just a way of life. It's actually an order of channels through which the spirit is given to the individual. And as we said this morning, through the prophet of the Lord and through priesthood leaders, that there are two channels of the spirit, one to the individual the gift of the Holy Ghost, the temple ordinances, etc. Then there is another channel, which is that which comes through the living prophet and through your stake presidency and through your bishops and through your elders, quorums, presidencies. This channel is the channel that has priority over the first one. If there is a difference between my revelation and the revelation of my stake presidency or my bishop, guess who should move? The answer is me. That's the order of the kingdom. The order of the kingdom isn't just to become great theologians and get theological knowledge. The order is to learn that process 
or those processes of ministering the Spirit through priesthood leaders and having a brotherhood relationship through priesthood leaders, so that together you can have the powers of the Spirit, and you can share and enjoy those blessings and grow in the bonds of brotherhood and love through the action of the Spirit within that priesthood framework. So the prophet speaking of that says this, We learn that Paul perfectly understood the purposes of God in relation to his connection with man. And note this, and that glorious and perfect order which he established in himself, that is, that which God established in himself, whereby he set forth power, revelations, and glory. Now there is a way that you can put a person into possession of the Holy Ghost and give them the personal tutelage of the third member of the Godhead. There is a way to do that, and every missionary knows that way. It is to teach that person to have faith in Jesus Christ and in his works in the, our day, the restoration and the living prophet, and to repent of his sins and to come down in humility into the waters of baptism by one having proper authority and done in the right way, and then having the laying on of hands. And every time that happens with a sincere and an honest and conscientious person, that person will get wired up, if I can use that term, to the Holy Ghost. And the powers and the gifts and the blessings of the Spirit will begin to develop in that person. Similarly, on a higher plane up here, there is a divine program by which, if we apply it, the end result will be that each person and each family in the snowflake stake will have a cloud and smoke by day and a flaming of a pillar of fire by night over their dwelling places. And this is a program involving the development of the gospel, and one day the Latter-day Saints will do that. When they do that, and not before, they will have Zion. This is Zion, Zion upon her mount, mounted upon her temple, and the saints sanctified and given the blessings of the Spirit. What is the Lord saying here, then, in connection with the whole thing? It is that there is a temple program he was unfolding at the same time these revelations that we've quoted from were given. This temple program was the law of consecration and stewardship. They ran into a hitch down in Jackson County. When they got there, the Lord said, Let me let, let you in on a fact. We've been developing these things simultaneously, but I'll let you in on a little secret. That is that you can't really do the temple fully and completely until you have been endowed with power from on high. So he says, Okay, now let's go and do that. That's 1834. Less than two years later, they de dedicated the Kirchland Temple. When they did, they had the gifts and the powers of the Spirit there because they had prepared for Pentecost. When they went to the solemn assembly and the, that secret meeting was held, there was an endowment of the Spirit. Fire came down. The whole building was enveloped in glory. People could see it from miles and miles away. This, then, was Zion. As the Lord spoke of that in section 110, this revelation recorded the visit of Christ to the Kirtland Temple and the coming of Moses and Elias, or Noah, and Elijah to the Kirtland Temple. Then the Lord has this to say in verse 8, as he promises the saints what he will do if they will perform their part. Yea, I will appear unto my servants and speak unto them with mine own voice, if my people will keep my commandments and do not pollute this holy house. We talked this morning about the benefits of following the living prophet, that there is a channel of power there, and that Zion is endowed with glory, and there is strength and union and spiritual power associated with this. What he is saying is, if you will really do your part, then I will appear to your prophet personally and give him direction personally, if the people will keep my commandments and do not pollute my holy house. Then he says, Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out, and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. Note now verse 10, And the fame of this house shall spread to foreign lands, and this is the beginning, not the high water mark, the beginning of the blessing which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people. Now Kirtland was the beginning, and the end result in which Zion is established, and there is a cloud and smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night over every dwelling place, then the question is, where are we in between? Where are we? 
and why have we not built from that level of things right on up? The reason is that we haven't applied the Lord's commandments as we ought. The reason is, as President Benson said, we are under condemnation as a church, and we need, in the most serious and critical sense of meaning, to awaken spiritually and not just to awake, that we might progress. But there are times that are very, very near. We are standing on the very threshold of these times when there is going to be such disruptions in the land and foreign lands as we have never seen. Peace will be literally taken from the earth and we are going to see financial collapse and we're going to see difficulties and challenges that we've never dreamed of. Unless we have founded our lives to the extent that we ought on the spiritual powers of his gospel, whatever else we have, we are going to fail. Now, it's just that blunt, my brothers and sisters. It's just that blunt and that meaningful. In this sense, then, the program of Zion is an unfolding program, and we need to prepare. All the words of the Lord must be fulfilled. We all know the Lord's statement that his word will not come back empty and unfulfilled. Yet, as I read the Doctrine and Covenants, there is a very large percentage of the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord gave instructions and commandments that we haven't done anything about. We didn't establish the law of consecration. What happened with the school of the prophets? It lasted three months in its full power. After that, they had a school, but it wasn't really the full-fledged program. We haven't really come up to the standard, yet in many ways we have done better than our fathers. Yet at the same time, in the midst of that, we are getting the mentality that Nephi talks about. All is well in Zion. Zion prospers. All is well. And he says, when we get that mentality that the devil is leading us carefully down to hell. But the point I want to make is this, that these revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants will be fulfilled in full. There will be saints in the latter days who will finally do everything the Lord has commanded. Here's how President Benson sees it. All the words of the Lord will be fulfilled, whether he gives the words himself or whether they come through inspiration and revelation of his servants. And his servants declare these words. The Holy Spirit bears testimony to all who seek to know the truth of the revelations and the commandments. Of late, when I read the Doctrine and Covenants, I do it with a different attitude than I used to. I used to read it for historical purposes to find out what the Lord said to the Latter-day Saints in those days. The way I read it now is to think and ponder over the issue. What do we really need to do to fulfill the full program of his intent? What do we really need to do in order to finally become a people like the people that he instructed and like they would have become had they obeyed, as given in the Doctrine and Covenants? What would we need to do? So you go back and you read it for its historical purposes, and then you go back and read it because you know that the Lord is going to fulfill all his word. And if that generation didn't do so, then as the prophet Joseph Smith once said, a future generation will. Here is more from President Benson. For the righteous, the gospel provides a warning before a calamity, a program for the crisis, refuge for each disaster. Here is another one. The revelation to store food may be as essential to our temporal salvation today as boarding the ark was to the people in the days of Noah, and you ha have him saying here in this statement, the strength of the church welfare lies in every family following the inspired direction of the church leaders to be self-sustaining through adequate preparation. God intends for us saints to so prepare themselves that the church, as the Lord has said, and this is, is section 78 verses 13 through 14, may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world. As the Lord puts it there, he puts it this way. I think I can quote it. Notwithstanding the tribulation which shall come, implying that this thing is in preparation for a difficult time, that the saints may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world. Independent means that I as a person am master of my concerns. I am out of debt. I don't owe anyone. I have my feet spiritually established on the gospel. I love my bishop. I love and honor and sustain in acts of dedication and sincerity my stake presidency. I love the prophet. I pray for him daily. 
I have a witness in my life and my soul that he is in very deed God's oracle on earth, and the fire of that testimony goes clear down to the depths of my soul. That's what I'm talking about. He goes on and says, President Brigham Young said, If you are without bread, how much wisdom can you boast? Real utility are your talents. If you cannot procure for yourselves and save against a day of scarcity, those substances designed to sustain your natural lives. If you cannot provide for your natural lives, how can you expect to have wisdom to obtain eternal lives? When will all these calamities strike? We do not know the exact time, but it appears that it may be in the not too far distant future. Those who are prepared now have the continued blessings of early obedience, and they are ready. Noah built his ark before the flood came, and he and his family survived. Those who waited to act until after the flood came were too late. With that act, Noah became the world's great financier. He floated his stock while everyone else got theirs liquidated. After we have a little break, I'd like to move into the prophetic picture in light of what we've said and kind of develop not just the fact that difficulties come, but see if we can see some sequence of things and see in some measure where we are. So why don't we take some of the questions that we have at this point and then we'll take a break and come back to a more prophetic aspect of our discussion this evening. Question. Matthew twenty four forty, Two in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken. Is this next city of Zion or the city of Zion itself? Answer. It is neither. This statement by the Savior applies to his coming in his glory. As he opens the veil and makes his appearance in his glory, then the last great gathering of the righteous will be done by angels. There will be two at the mill, and one will be taken. There will be two in the fields, and one will be taken, and the other left. They will be taken and caught up to meet him in the clouds. Question. Is this a particular type of economy that is most compatible with the Zion society? Answer. Some people used to ask me, Brother Andrus, is the law of consecration capitalistic? And I would say no. Is the law of consecration socialistic? I would say no. Is the law of consecration communistic? I would say no. And then they would scratch their heads and say, well, what is it? I would say it is a united orderistic. It's a critter all by itself. It's like me. There's not another homely person like me on earth. It's an animal all of itself. Instead of being founded upon mere free enterprise economics, it's founded on covenant. It's not founded on socialism. It's not founded on communism. We've had some experiments in the history of the church that had one communal, this thing we call Orderville down here in Utah. It was simply nothing more than Christian communism. If I had been there, I would have been one of the rebels in the community. It's a good thing I wasn't. But it was simply a system of Christian communism. Question. Is the free market economy with its accompanying business cycles with labor layoffs compatible with Zion? Answer. The answer is no. A free market society in Christ, sanctified in Christ, with the infusion of his Holy Spirit, with the infusion with the idea of treating your brother as yourself, with the st stability that comes from divine revelation. That's the picture. It's not the cycle picture. Question. Will a Zion society developing in Africa have to westernize and industrialize? Will Americans have to be re-industrialized? Answer. Americans are going to have to repent, and so will everyone else. It isn't a matter of industrializing. It's a matter of repenting. Question. Will there be sinners in the future Zion society? Answer. The answer may be yes. They may lose their stewardship and be cast out of the system because of their fa failure to uphold the covenants they have entered into. Question. Without opposition and evil, will the necessary conditions exist that individuals born into the society be tested and overcome evil? We did fight the war in heaven in order to face evil and temptations, didn't we? Answer. Well, some people think that when the millennium is here, that there will be no opposition. I had a good brother in our priesthood quorum who gets up and preaches that. 
As we were walking out of the room, I put my arm lovingly around his neck and wrestled him a little bit and said, I'd like to ask you a question. He said, okay. Who challenged Abraham the most, the devil or the Lord? You think about that. He knew what I was talking about. The Lord gave him the worst time of his life. It wasn't the devil. Then I just cited in the scriptural statement that the Lord is a refiner's fire, and he's going to refine and purify people. Some people say the devil is not going to be here in the millennium. I say, so what? The Lord is going to be here. It's not on the same principle, but the Lord is a refiner's fire. On the other hand, we will be raised to a spiritual plane to where it will essentially be a new ball game. But we're not contemplating the millennium as a peaceful society without any kind of opposition or without any dynamics to it or without any challenge. I mean, this is naive. Well, we've gone way over time. I'm just going to say the Lord bless you and let's have about five minutes and we'll get back to the prophetic picture. Thank you.